Lord, I just pray that uh, you'd speak to us today, that more than uh, what you put on my heart to say, that um, if you want to change that, Lord, that you'd feel free to do so, so that we hear you and what you want to say to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there are a lot of, if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm setting a timer so that when it goes off, you'll know that I'm running over time, right? So there are a lot of um, religious people in our world today. In fact, there are a lot of people that enjoy being religious, and some people have chucked the religion thing, and they're just trying to be spiritual. But whether you're uh, a religious type or a spiritual type, uh, the, the result is kind of the same. You're trying to do something that is going to get you in better standing either with God or just a better inner sense of well-being and harmony so that you can feel better about the world and live more in harmony with uh, the world around you. Whichever that is, um, uh, religious is a very popular, still very popular in our culture. We think of many people as religious, both inside and outside of Christian circles. Outside of Christian circles, we would think of uh, the Dalai Lama or Oprah. Inside of Christian circles, we might think of the Pope or Billy Graham. We alternately respect and suspect religious people in our society. But James here in chapter one of the book named after him, James gives us a definition of religion. Uh, I call it true religion, not because of the genes, but because of the uh, phrase in 127 that says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. So hence, true religion. James gives us a definition of that, and if you have an outline in your bulletin and you'd like to pull that out, if it helps you to fill in the blanks, to kind of track, uh, it always helps me, so I invite you to just fill it out. And uh, there are a few blanks here, even in the definition of true religion. True religion is a religion that is based on faith, not ritual or ceremony. It is something that first and foremost must be in your heart before it gets to your head and out to your hands. We know that religion, this kind of religion, is based on faith because we know that God accepts this religion as pure and faultless. And in Hebrews 11:6, we read that without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God. Now, wouldn't it be nice if the writer of Hebrews would have rewritten that verse and it said something more like, without faith, it's possible but difficult to please God. <laughs> or without faith, oh, it's possible to please God if you're just a nice person. But instead, the Holy Spirit inspired the writer of Hebrews to say, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we know that this religion is based on faith. If we zoom out from James 1, 26 and 27 and just go to the next verse, which is the first verse of chapter 2, and you know that the chapter and verse headings, they didn't come from God when, when he inspired the, the, the writing of Scripture, right? Right? The chapters and verses came much later so that we could organize our thoughts around Scripture and we could find things and memorize things and know where it is, right? So if you find a chapter or a verse break that doesn't make much sense, well, it probably doesn't. Just keep reading. And in chapter 2, verse 1, we see that instead of religion, James uses the word faith, faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. So first and foremost... It's a religion that's based on relationship, given by grace, received through faith, as we read in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I wonder if we could put that on the screen, if we could read that together. Ready? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, 
not by works so that no one can boast. True religion has three characteristics. First of all, it controls your conversation. Secondly, it reveals your compassion. And thirdly, it keeps you clean. Now, I suppose that if you fill that out, you could tune out the rest of this message and just remember that, but I hope that you don't. First of all, true religion controls your conversation. You know, religious people, as I talked about earlier, do a lot of things, right? We do, we do ceremonies and speeches and sacrifices and rituals and there's bells and smells and there's smoke and mirrors and on the downside there's also sometimes uh, we want to keep religion popular so we'll tolerate some teaching that's not really on the mark so we can keep everybody happy or maybe uh, maybe we'll, we'll defend our own establishment by some political wrangling and things like that in our religion or there's sometimes a lot of self-seeking in religion but James brings religion right down to its very basis and says, if your religion does any good, if it's worth anything, here's the basic. Can it control your conversation? If a man thinks himself as religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. So, show of hands, how many of you like to, uh, and I think there's a little video that goes along with this um, uh, that you can watch while we're talking about this, but how many of you like to ride horses? Hands in the air, anybody? Okay, how many of you own a horse? Okay, fine. Any, anybody else? Okay, super. How many of you who've ridden horses have had the best rides of your life in the world with a horse that has no bridle in it? It's just, <laughs> okay, figures, JD's going to be contrary. Did you raise your hand when I said, does anybody ride a horse? Has anybody, no, you didn't. Okay, not anymore. All right, uh, Journey, have you ever, uh, would you normally take a horse out with no bridle in it, try to ride it? No. Why is a bridle important for the horse? Control. It's really not important for the horse, it's important for you, right? <laughs> so that you can guide the horse where you need it to go, and so you can stop the horse if you need it to stop. Now, James says that our tongues are very much like that, and I want to ask you, have you had something you wanted to say, and your religion stopped you from saying it? Have you become uncomfortable because what you wanted to say wouldn't be in accordance with your religion? If you haven't, then what's James say about your religion? What's James say about our religion? We need to keep a tight rein on our tongues. Psalm 30, uh, I'm sorry, in Proverbs, or you, that's, why you did, that's why you were like, why, why are we going to the horse video, right? In Proverbs, uh, we read in chapter 10, verse 19, when words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. And in Psalm 39, 1, this is right after the horse video. I screwed them up in the back and, and uh, made them wash the horse early. In Psalm 39, 1, David says... I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth. You know, it's so easy to talk about how much we love somebody. And then when they're not around, we can say all kinds of crap about them. Huh? It's so easy sometimes to say how much we love Jesus. And then with our, when we're out with our friends, suddenly Jesus' name slips out as a curse word. That shouldn't be so among us. I love the old prayer that says, Lord, keep your arm around my shoulder and your hand over my mouth. Because what comes out of our mouths is important because it reveals what's in our hearts. Jesus 
has these very startling words to say in Matthew chapter 12. A tree is identified by its fruit. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes. I just love it when Jesus says that, huh? You brood of snakes. And he said this to religious dudes. Remember this. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right? In fact, these weren't just religious dudes. These were religious dudes from his own Jewish denomination. And he was calling them out. You brood of snakes. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. That's why it's important for our religion to control our conversation. So our religion must be, uh, and, and worship team is going to come up right now. We're going to have part two of the message in a little bit. Our religion first must be in our hearts. And then it will flow out of our mouths, controlling our conversation and ruling our hands and then revealing our compassion. And we'll